Today we have uh, My Diabetes Tutor. It's, uh, it's one of the startups that we curated and found that doing some impressive works, work in the diabetes world. Well, uh, our speaker today is the Dr. Prem Sahasranam. Uh, he's a board certified endocrinologist and the CEO of My Diabetes Tutor. He has uh, over 15 years experience in diabetes care is on a mission to make diabetes educator uh, accessible in rural communities. Uh, they have created an innovative program, uh, which includes inpatient diabetes education, on-call services, diabetes prevention, and remote patient monitoring and weight management. So all in all, it's an amazing program, and, and, and they have some great results to show uh, of their program. It's uh, uh, so, without much ado, uh, Prem, the stage is yours. Thank you, Dr. Willi. Thanks for uh, having me here. I'm Dr. Prem Sahas. I'm a board-certified endocrinologist. I'm the founder, chief medical officer of my diabetes tutor. Uh, like, uh, so uh, I would like to start, like you know. So my diabetes tutor, it's a telehealth program for diabetes education. And what we provide at my diabetes tutor is, is like we do like virtual diabetes education. We provide like medical nutrition therapy. We have we 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 piloted out doing remote patient monitoring program. And we also do device training. So uh uh, what we are doing is we are addressing the critical gap in diabetes management. And if you ask any other phys physicians, they would agree that perhaps with no other disease, does diabetes make a profound difference to life and limb? So I would like to start, uh, share a story. I would like to say, uh, tell why I started my diabetes tutor. I've been in practice since 2007, and I built a very successful practice in Central Valley, which is a underserved area, I consulted over 35,000 patients. Uh, in, in 2018, uh, I had two full-time diabetes educators in my practice. And uh, in 2018, my educators decided to retire, and uh, I had no success recruiting educators to my practice. So I decided to build a telehealth program. Uh, 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 like I built the contents team technology, got the accreditation. I built the program to bring educators from other parts of the country to underserved communities. So that's the story behind how I got into my diabetes tutor. Next slide. So we all know that diabetes is a huge issue. It's like over 40 million people living in the country with diabetes. And every 21 seconds, someone in the US is diagnosed with diabetes. You have controlled and uncontrolled diabetes, but the vast majority of the people are uncontrolled. 75% of the patients have difficulty managing their diabetes. And it's the uncontrolled diabetes which leads to increased healthcare cost, it increases the health risk. And one diabetes education has been very proven to help uh, control diabetes. And patients going through diabetes education has been shown to have a 0.73 point reduction in A1C. So we know that diabetes is a huge risk. Diabetes education is found to be effective, but Next slide. But the uh, the uh, but diabetes education is very not uh, we know its effectiveness, but the utilization for diabetes education is very low. It's not reaching out to patients. If you really look at the numbers, or five, only five to seven percent of the patients with diabetes receive some sort of diabetes education during the first year of diagnosis. And uh, insurance, Medicare and insurance companies allows patients to receive education every year. And the utilization is much lower. Only 1.7% of the patients with diabetes go through some form of education. And the reason is access issue and availability issue. 
So due to the decre lower decreased access and availability, the patients are not able to receive diabetes education. And the situation is more was it's more, more pronounced in underserved communities. This graph, so my diabetes tutor, it's like a health equity solutions. If you really look at the numbers, 62% of the non-metropolitan counties do not have a di diabetes education program. And so what we are doing is solving an access issue. Next slide. So I will turn over to, uh, to, to Adam Boris to present, continue the presentation. Yes, thanks, Dr. Sahas. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Adam Boris. I'm Chief Operating Officer. I've been with My Diabetes Tutor for about 18 months now, and I'm really excited to be here. We have uh, had some excellent growth. We've uh, tripled in size uh, year over year, and uh, we're over five times uh, the rate we were when we started 18 months ago down this journey to grow this business. Uh, so the solution that uh, we're bringing to the table is a tech-enabled platform with a human touch. And what we're finding is the connection that our patients feel with their educator in, in up to 10 one-to-one -one sessions that are you know, covered by virtually every, uh, not just covered, but encouraged by most payers, including not only Medicare, but most commercial plans, even Medicaid in the state of California encourages diabetic education because for obvious reasons, it keeps patients managed and out of the emergency room for hyperglycemic or hypoglycemic events. And there's even a congressional bill right now that is promoting increased access to virtual diabetes education. So we have the government with their uh, tailwind behind our backs trying to uh, get people more access. As you saw from the previous slide, very few Medicare patients avail themselves of the important education they need every year, not just once, uh, as there are many different things that could drive the need for additional education. In addition to the 10 uh, sessions that are covered in the first year, uh, patients are eligible for two hours of ed additional education every year in perpetuity as diabetic, diabetes is a lifelong disease. And we also provide medical nutrition therapy, which is another uh, two to three hours of uh, education uh, that's specific to nutrition and diet. And then, of course, Dr. mentioned uh, uh, remote patient monitoring programs are available as well. So the, another unique aspect of our program, in addition to uh, the relationships that we build, we always have the same educator go through uh, with each patient. So they, they build a, a relationship of accountability and trust as the patient goes through their education journey. Uh, we make it as simple as possible. So the whole purpose of this platform is simplicity. So we make it extremely simple for the patient the patient clicks on one link that they can receive on as a text message or on their laptops via email. There is no downloads. There's no Zoom. There's no apps to worry about. It's a single click and the educator space pops up and the same exact experience for the educator. They click a link and their patient pops up, which makes uh, the whole experience far easier for the patient to manage and they don't have to leave their house. They don't have to worry about anything. Uh, we handle the uh, insurance uh, verifications if they're necessary. So all the patient has to do is show up and, and share what their needs are with us. And every uh, group of education sessions starts with an assessment with our educator where we make sure that we're customizing the education for their needs. And then, of course, because our platform is based on a core technology uh, from Charm Health, we're able to scale very seamlessly uh, in terms of volume, really aren't limited right now by technology as far as our ability to scale. The, the other where, way where we make things unique is we make it very simple for the referring physician. There's a single page referral form 
uh, we can accept, we have an online form they can fill out, they can fax us, they can send us a PDF. Uh, we're trying to remove all the reasons why uh, physicians would not want to refer patient for diabetes. One of the biggest ones is that they're not, their patients don't report good feedback uh, with uh, education sessions when they are sent for education. And a lot of that is because patients have to travel sometimes very long distances to get to education sessions. A lot of those sessions are group sessions and they're not well executed and not individualized and patients give up. Our satisfaction ratings are off the charts. 96% rated us very good, 99% would recommend. I don't think there's too many healthcare services products in, in the entire country that can boast that level of satisfaction. I'll go into some more details on the survey in the next slides. Um, the other thing that makes us different is um, we support type one. A lot of apps and other uh, diabetes education and support kind of systems are focused on type twos, not necessarily in insulin dependent patients. Uh, we, we focus on all of the difficult patients. We focus on patients with pumps, we focus on patients with uh, automatic glucose monitors. And those two things interact. And so we're trying to, you know, patients like a cyborg, they got two devices talking to each other, they got numbers flashing up, they don't know how to use it, uh, and, they, and they struggle. And we step in and take care of that with them. We're their partner as they explore all of these different challenges. So we do the hard things in diabetes support. Uh, of course, in addition to access, language is a big barrier, especially in California. We do uh, Spanish. We have our materials written in Spanish and English. We support other languages, as you can see. Uh, and uh, we also have diversified our revenue streams by being able to provide initial device training for different kinds of pumps and different kinds of continuous glucose monitors. So we're actually paid by the manufacturers themselves because they want to partner with us because they know we perform quality education and we're certified for those kind of initial uh, trainings and starts, which also takes a lot of the strain off physicians that sometimes don't want to write for these uh, devices because they don't have the time in their office to train these patients on using these devices. They don't want to get, you know, 30 calls a day into their office from patients saying, well, why is this flashing five? You know, and this is the kind of things that we step in and handle and make sure that the, the physician has a great experience with launching a new patient on a device and then that patient coming to the office with results that are attractive and, 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 and questions that make sense instead of worrying about how the device works. So uh, we also have all of our educators are certified nationally. So we have a national label, labor pool to leverage. We don't have to worry about trying to find people in California for California patients. We have customers in many states across the country and we have educators, uh, 26 educators, they're located in various states all over the country. Um, so obviously um, none of that makes any difference if you can't move the needle. And our outcome data is twice the national average. And that, and that is profound and I'll show you that in a minute in a different slide. So this is a reinforcement of specifically of our survey result from last year which involved 256 patients. We send an automated survey out after every session. We also fax or email uh, the session notes for the referring physician is always informed for every single education encounter, what the status of that patient is and what the course of treatment is going to be going forward. Um, and then we just repeated the survey. I don't have a slide on it yet, but the results were almost identical uh, for 220 surveys that we sent out since the beginning of the year. So we're maintaining our quality even as we went up 5X in size. So um, there was a study done by the PHTI, uh, a meta-analysis of hundreds of thousands of patients across many different wellness apps and 
and apps that are supposed to be uh, helping you manage your diabetes. And the average drop in A1C across that cohort was only 0.415. And they said in their study, to be clinically meaningful, it would have to be at least 0.5. According to the NIH, um, the average for an education session or series of sessions is 0.73 at 12 months. We're doing more than double that the national average at 1.6 across thousands of patients. I think we hit 5,000. Uh, this particular number is trailing 12 months. So that uh, that's uh, over a thousand patients for sure. Then for a specific cohort of 450 patients from United Health, which is an FQHC here, we averaged a 2.6 point reduction in A1C. And TRICARE, where we have an exclusive referral relationship, for virtual education for diabetes, we averaged uh, a four point reduction. So we're, we're moving the needle profoundly here. Without outcomes, nothing else matters. So uh, in terms of the market, uh, getting to the business side, um, you know, from those earlier statistics about people that are eligible for education but not getting it, 14.3 million patients need education now their payers are all willing to pay for, for the education. That means a total addressable market of 7.5 billion for the first year of education, and then 1.8 billion in recurring market opportunity. It's a huge underserved market with, it's a well-defined reliable revenue model. So we're not a product that's trying to find their first, uh, you know, who's gonna pay me kind of question. Or, or get approved by Medicare or the uh, AMA, we know exactly how much we're getting paid by every payer, and we know that they want us to do this and that they support this education. So you can see the growth has been quite impressive towards the end of last year when we really started kicking in our marketing campaign. Uh, we, we raised uh, uh, almost $2 million in our uh, first uh, funding round, which was a safe note. And that uh, really accelerated our growth towards the end of the year. We had about 4,200 visits by the end of the year. And this year we're on track for nearly 12,000 uh, patient encounters. And that would lead uh, to a cash revenue of 1.1 million uh, and then growing to cash flow break even in 2026, assuming we can close on our funding that we're seeking today. So this summarizes the financial uh, aspect of what we're trying to do. We have uh, about 2 million invested into the company to date. Uh, we had invoiced revenue of almost 570,000 last year. We're on target for 1.5 million in 2024. Uh, we're looking for 4 million in capital and we should be able to hit 4 million in revenue in the year 2025, assuming we can secure that capital by the end of this year. And we're anticipating a cash flow break even in 2026 at a 15 million pre-money valuation. And we're accelerating that growth beyond this year because right now it's, uh, we're stepping on the gas. We're growing as fast as we can. Literally this month, we're, we've exhausted uh, most of our educator capacity because uh, we're about to have a record month of uh, over 700 encounters in a single month. And we can do all that while maintaining quality and maintaining gross margins near 38%. We also have a very experienced team. Uh, obviously, Prem has been an entrepreneur and successfully grown his practice with over 40,000 patients uh, over the last 20 years. Uh, I've, I have personally been involved in several uh, early stage companies and also um, lower middle market companies with a successful sale of the company to Baxter that was selling software to 1,200 hospitals. Bob, our CFO, has had five exits between 10 and 100 million uh, and has raised capital for many companies over the years. Uh, and Michael Baer, our chief marketing officer, has extensive experience with all stages of companies, including significant achievements at, at middle market companies and Fortune 500 companies. And then Brian Dunstead, our chief technology officer, has also been involved in VC backed companies, including MD Live, which was sold for two, two plus billion dollars recently. 
So we're asking you to collaborate with us. Uh, we're, we're breaking down social determinants of health barriers. Uh, we're trying to improve the healthcare literacy and the quality of life for everyone challenged with diabetes. Too many people are focused on, you know, the top 20% of employed insurance patients. Only 55% of the patients in this country are insured through an employer. Uh, there's 45% of 320 million people that need help and diabetes is growing at an alarming rate, and we want to be that solution. Uh, there's definitely a, a business model for doing this. Uh, we're going to be uh, adding some uh, technology to our solution in between visits to help with stickiness and continuity um, and uh, getting people to stay with us for multiple years and multiple sessions. But right now, with the technology we have, we're helping a lot of people move the needle on A1C and literally changing their lives. So that's the end of my prepared presentation. I'm happy to ask any questions and dive deeper into the financials or the technology. Great, great presentation, uh, Adam and Prem. Thank you. Um, it's a very interesting company, you know. You know, this, one of the things that I've, I've been thinking about this and and uh, trying to understand what is so special about this company. Uh, you know, diabetes has been with us forever, right? And we all know that education is important in diabetics. And everybody says, okay, you know, we should be paying for this. Why do, why do you think there aren't, why do you think this problem hasn't been solved yet? Why do you think, you know, there's still a need for new companies to come in and, and do this? You know, this is like, this should be like bread and butter for, for you know, people that are, that are treating diabetes, right? You know, why, why, why you, why now, why hasn't it been solved yet? Well, I think I'd have to say that Dr. Sahas's vision is is really what's driving this. Is he saw a gap in the market, and and it's like any business, right? Uh, the the person that invented the umbrella saw a lot of people getting wet in the street, and, and probably thought to himself, "Well, why didn't someone come up with an umbrella?" I mean, this is exactly the same opportunity. We're we're not inventing a cure for cancer but we're, we're finding a, a way that we're solving the pain points for so many people. We're solving the insurance pay, pain point. We're solving the referral pain point. We're solving the language and the transportation pain points. And we're developing a, a repeatable, scalable model that is difficult to replicate because of the energy it took to solve all those problems simultaneously. Yeah, I, I think, uh, let me... Go ahead, Frank. Frank. Oh, Frank. Uh, you, you're you're on mute, Frank. If you're speaking. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I think from a physician's point of view, anything related to you know non-medical work is viewed as an an, an an extra you know headache for me. If something is available, you know, in terms of service. We you know all we, all we need to do is a refer, and then we forget about it, and they do go through the program, and they come back with results. You know, I don't think the product like this was not available. Only we had was diabetic educators, sparsely situated and difficult to get appointments with. I think that's where Prem got a niche, and you know he developed the program from ground up, and uh, he he developed the curriculum. He went into the you know, uh, the, the great lens in terms of, you know, diabetes and through its uh, you know, national entities to see what the guidelines are. And he went according to what is needed and really, you know, developed a neat and a unique program. And he also directly went to the insurance companies rather than go through individual, you know, doctors or the hospitals. And he went uh, above them. And uh, that's, that's where he was able to scale this you know, at a faster level. 
because there was no barriers from insurance companies to approve this, you know, because it was already, you know, approved by the insurance company. They wanted this kind of a product. And on top of that, he went national in terms of remoteness and as well as a telehealth platform. And that's why he was able to assemble a team of, you know, qualified diabetic educators. And I think, you know, the results also proves clearly, you know, this is something tip of an iceberg where we have not seen this kind of results in large populations like this. Yeah, so yeah. That's why I think it's a unique program is unique. And I've been watching this very carefully from, you know, from below because I meet with him almost every other day. And it's amazing how how fast, you know, this has developed within the last three years. And yeah. COVID also helped. COVID also helped with the, you know, innovative thinking about telehealth platforms. It was not available to us before. We didn't think about it. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the one thing I would emphasize on, on Dr. Vini's point, and that is that the scale really makes the difference because we're able to hire all kinds of different languages. We're able to do that because a, an individual practice doesn't have enough volume to hire their own educators and, and educators of different languages and, and do all of the paperwork it's necessary to get paid. Uh, it, it's not efficient for an individual practice to have this service unless they're really large. And yeah. so I, I think that's another really big, you know, solution point for, for uh, you know, Dr. Sahas's vision is if we aggregate this service, we can do it effectively, cost effectively, where, you know, we can make good money and then, you know, the patient and the doctor still have a positive experience without burdening their office. Even large medical practices groups, uh, they don't have uh, diabetes educators in house and, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I get the point. Uh, by the way, audience, uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand um, so that I can get you to ask your question. Or you can, you know, type it in the chat. We have some questions on the chat, I think. Okay, let's see what we have. Uh, great presentation. This is from Jonathan. Great presentation, Adam. What uh, CPD code do you bill for and what is the amount per encounter? So a GL 108 is the number one code that we bill is for education. And uh, that's typically billed at about $120 an hour at the Medicare rate. Um, most other commercial payers are very close to that. Uh, some pay more. Um, I think Medicaid is very close to that as well in California. So uh, we do have other services, medical nutrition therapy, which is very similar rate for an hour. And then uh, remote patient monitoring has about seven or eight different codes, which I don't have memorized, unfortunately. But uh, we have all that financially analyzed. If anyone's interested in digging deep into the financials, we can schedule a one-on-one -on -one session and walk you through all of that. And uh, also follow up, can you bill under the FQHC's PPS rate? Which right now? FQHC? Uh, I mean, yes, FQHC's are some of our biggest customers. So uh, do they have a, a different rate, PPS rate? Some, sometimes. I mean, I think there's some rates around 90. I, I don't remember exactly, Dr. Sahas, what, what the rates are. I think the question was whether we can bill at FQHC rates. Uh, so what we do is we bill for the services here. And uh, we don't provide the service and have the FQHC bill. We directly bill. That should be the question, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, people are thinking about questions. Uh, one of the questions was, one of the questions I had was, uh, if you had, you know, started with technology instead of you, you started with people and then now you're building the technology around it. What is, what is your... Um, Philosophy behind it. What what is, what is the thinking behind it? Why did you not start I think, with the technology I think first? The, the, the human touch aspect of it is the most important thing that we found actually makes a difference. So I think we we kind of you know started out with a strong technology. It's just we didn't have to invent it. 
So yeah. the charm system with the single click access has been with us for from day one. So uh, we've added CRM systems, we've added uh, scheduling systems, we've added lots of other tech, and we're going to plug in a behavioral AI kind of platform called Gomo that we're working with right now. But um, what 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 the best thing is we found in terms of moving the needle on actual results was was the one to one relationship with the patient and the educator that that accountability aspect of it. There's a lot of technology that we believe in and we're going to add that will help with, like I said, patient stickiness. So they, instead of doing five sessions with us, they continue through all 10. That kind of behavior and, and communication in between visits is important. We recognize that and we're going to add it, but we wanted to make sure we could move the needle and, and uh, demonstrate what can work at scale um, before we, we dove into the technology pool because there's so many people already at that pool. So we also plan to build like an AI, AI chat where the patients can have their questions answered between visits. We, have our, we do hours of education and our goal yeah. is to also build an AI for uh, patient interaction between visits. And, and as I mentioned, as I saw in that slide, uh, a lot of the competing companies that are tech only, uh, they're app based, are just not moving the needle. I mean, they're moving it a little bit, but not clinically significantly. So uh, that's the other reason we didn't go there first is because there hasn't been a lot of success there. Really, really. Um, yeah, I, I hear that, that, you know, the digital health is not that great if you just you know, they think that with the technology, you can scale much faster, but also, and cheaper probably, but the effectiveness of that has, has not been, you know, uh, uh, I haven't seen uh, results that are as, as great as yours are. Um, if, let's say, let's say you don't get funded, let's say you are not able to raise money, what is the plan B? Well, I, so plan B would be to trim the growth of the business to the point of organic, organically supporting growth at a smaller level. I mean, so, this thing can operate with a gross margin of 50%, just the cost of the educator versus the incoming revenue. There's enough money to sustain it. Uh, it it'll just kill our growth. So really, yeah. the four billion is, is is for the growth, and and we could conceivably take five times that. I mean, it's a national market. We could find a uh, a larger marketing partner, and we are talking to a few to scale us even faster. So uh, right now, what we can be sure we can do is is you know what we've demonstrated in 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 this presentation. If we got four million. And and all else was equal. It's very predictable. It's it's right now yeah. we're at the point where we're turning the crank. We know how to scale. We know how many educators we need per patient. We know how many schedulers we need. Uh, we we know how many referrals we're going to get when we recruit physicians, and and when we partner with insurance companies with thousands of lives. So we've been through that with four or five different partners, and uh, so we know how to get there from here. This this isn't a guesswork. We know what we can do with four million and deliver. If there's some some things that come through that with partnerships, we can accelerate even faster. And uh, sorry, I missed that slide about uh, the the evaluation. Uh, by the way, if uh, anybody's interested, please uh, uh, to for for uh, this company to contact you. Please leave your email in the poll. Um, I know there are some physicians who are interested in this. Uh, while you're doing that, I missed the slide on the, on, I know that you're raising 4 million, but what's the valuation for that? What's the cap? Million. 15 million cap, okay. Um, okay, this is, I mean, looking at, you know, three years, five years from now, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, the GLP-1 class of drugs, how are you incorporating that into your program? Do you do that? Or is that a separate business you're thinking about or haven't thought about? Um, 
I think we, we have education on that and, and uh, we have a session on it. So it, it, if, it, it's, if it applies to that patient and the, and the doctor wants the patient educated on it, we can add that to their program. But obviously not everybody has that need. So uh, like I said, each, set, each, each educator has the first session as an assessment. So if they have a certain device they've just been prescribed, then we focus on that first. If they are well aware of what diabetes is and understand what a carbohydrate is, we don't spend a lot of time on that. We move to diet, we move to exercise and lifestyle. So it, it, it's really customized, but it would not be difficult uh, to uh, provide the education part of that patient. Again, my diabetes tutor is not a prescriber and we certainly wouldn't be doing the injections. It's a virtual service, but we would be providing the education around that. So That's I can answer Uli's question. What Uli was asking is like uh, how, like GLP, you have lots of patients going on GLP analogs. So I think uh, it's, uh, I think education, uh, lifestyle changes along with GLP analog, it, we, you will probably see better outcomes. And what we do, the, what we are doing is the education piece. So you still, you'll still need the education piece, whatever the treatment what may the be. Treatment, yeah. uh, yeah. Because it's, it's a lifelong thing and then they it's have to continue. Thing continue to be educated and, on that. At some point, the GLP, GLP analogs will plateau if you don't make lifestyle changes. Yeah. Then we are and also, nothing. No, or, or unless they take it for the rest of their lives, I guess. Um, well, and then right. there's side effects and things to anticipate of around course. it. So, you know, that needs more education and more support. Correct. <laughs> um, uh, Jay has a question. Jay Sonmez. Uh, yes. So there are introduce introduce yeah. yourself and yes, I'm also co-founder of another startup. We are actually developing insulin resistance device, so similar to what he's dealing with, but before uh, targeting mostly non-diabetic people. But for his uh, work, there are companies like working under the digital therapeutics already developing tools like. The companies like Omada Health, Twin Health, uh, there is Teladoc, uh, and uh, Virta Health, Vida Health, you know, tons of it. Yeah. Uh, I can name like at least 10. They are already doing that part of their app. They have an app. They have also other protocols. They said, so how do you, uh, how do you uh, address those companies? Yeah, okay. Adam, you want to answer? Yeah, so... I didn't want to get to that detail, but since you brought it up, the meta-analysis done by PHTI uh, concluded that all of these behavioral lifestyle modification apps, the current evidence does not support broader adoption. So they, they fall into that camp of, of wellness apps that barely move the needle at 0.41 average A1C reduction. So we think we compete very fairly with that. Yeah, yeah that, that, this was a devastating study for a lot of those digital health uh, uh, companies that were, um, you know, selling this. So, so the idea is that with pure digital health, you can't move the needle as much as, you know, something where a person is involved, a human being on the other side um, of the phone or off the screen. Um, so, how does, uh, now cost-wise, if you're a digital health company and if it's a pure digital health company versus what you're doing with the, with the human in the middle, um, cost-wise, is it more expensive to do human, right, uh, in the middle? Well, absolutely. So your it's margins more... are, le are less? Well, I'm, I'm not sure about margins, but I can mm -hmm. tell you the cost is certainly more, but the compensation is more. So yeah. I, I don't think that the digital apps are, are getting, you know, $120 per encounter with wow. the digital app. So I, I don't know what their margins are based on what they're selling. You know, they're selling, you know, 30 yeah. bucks a month for 20 encounters. I, I don't know what the net is. I'd have to calculate it. But yeah. certainly we're getting more revenue. It's predictable revenue. And it's going to be the same for every patient pr pretty much. And our margin with the $45 we pay an educator is $55 roughly per session. So that's a healthy margin. 
And, uh, you know, net of collections and billing, and we're at 38% right now, and we think we can stay there or maybe improve as we scale. We'll be able to demonstrate that in the next couple of years. Now, I know that, you know, diabetes can be a, a piece of other chronic diseases. Are you looking at branching out into other disease categories? For example, hypertension, you know, high cholesterol, and other metabolic diseases, or even you know, cardiac area. I, I would say not for the foreseeable not future. For this time, I, know. I, I think, given the the scale of this market opportunity, uh, you know, my personal perspective is it's 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 kind of suicide for a startup to try and go five different ways at once. Yeah. So I, I think you need to focus on your market and grow to to at least profitability before you start uh, trying to worry about, uh, you know, adding to the portfolio. So I can yeah. tell one thing to our business model is we, is we work with health systems. We d work directly with health plans. We work with providers and hypertension is lots managed by uh, providers. And uh, I, I don't think, you know, just diabetes has a huge market and we don't want to uh, compete with any providers and uh, yeah. take away their business. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. We make it uh, very clear to the providers that, you know, we're not trying to usurp their patient relationship. And that's why we provide them uh, notes after every session so they can continuously monitor their patient. And if they need medication changes or, or anything that requires physician intervention, we'll send them back to their primary care or back to their uh, you know, endo, so so they can uh, maintain that relationship. Now, um, so you're you're you know, getting into the growth phase. By the way, how many? Uh, what's your headcount right now? People, uh -huh. about thirty. Thirty, yeah, great. Um, so, when you when you when you're you know rec recruiting these patients or or, or getting these contracts from from physicians or practices or insurance companies. What is the benefit for the providers, the physicians? What is, what is the benefit when they refer patients to you? I think uh, the, for providers, it's like they're getting, providers are limited by the, hour, the amount of time they got to spend with the patient. Patient average mm -hmm. provider gets like 15 to 20 minutes and yeah. they don't have the support system. They don't have the, uh, uh, they don't have the time support system to deliver diabetes education to the patient. So uh, we are helping the providers and we are improving the outcome. And uh, we work with the providers and improve the outcome. And, and, uh, and end of the day, the patient outcome is better. Patient satisfaction is better. And provider rating gets, improve, gets better by doing that. Yeah, so a lot of the FQHCs and managed care programs that we're working with, they have very specific goals of what percent of their diagnosed diabetics are below nine A1C or below eight, whatever the threshold that's set. And they're actually using us because we know we can move the needle. So they sent us 100 of their worst patients or 500 of their worst patients uh, because they know that that's gonna end up making a, a big bonus for their, for their plan at the end of the year if they can get enough people under nine. So it's, it, it, there's financial incentives, there's HEDIS metrics and patient satisfaction. And frankly, they're gonna have more satisfied patients that's, that's gonna be likely to stay with them. So, and we're trying to make it as easy as possible, as I mentioned, removing friction. So we're not, we're not asking them to bill this, we're not asking them to chase their insurance. We're doing all that for them. If a prior auth's needed, we do it. Uh, so all they have to do is send us a referral and we handle it from there. Mm -hmm. And and also, I think you're decreasing their workload. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, not only that, at the end, you know, the you know the this this my diabetic tutor is like a partner with uh, not only the you know patients but also the physicians or the groups and insurance companies to deliver a product which is going to improve their lifestyle, because, uh, improve their quality of life as well as potential complication. Because you are you know making a tangible difference in control of diabetes and uh, moving the A1C level. Uh, eventually the complication rate is going to be down as you, as you control the diabetes, 
like, you know, my, my job is going to be easier as a, as a cardiologist. I don't need to worry about <laughs> putting these people in the... And we are really seeing growth uh, I mean, the, in the FQHC community health center space. That's where we're going to grow. I see. I see. Now, um, now is 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 the billing different for when you when you are dealing with uh, let's say a value based care organization uh, versus a fee for service? Sometimes, sometimes the sometimes the underlying insurer we bill them directly. Sometimes the plan itself. Uh, wants to be billed, uh, so we have to sign a separate contract with the plan. But mm -hmm. really, as far as the billing process, it's no different. You're just sending it to a different payer. Uh, and you know, we work with dozens of payers now, and I think we're the first and only to be certified by Medi-Cal. And uh, I think we're the, the first certified by Medicare. So um, you know, the so the other. You know, you mentioned what else do we do for physicians? I, I think I mentioned before, you get a lot of nuisance calls into the office, right? Because when you're glucometer, you can't figure out how it works. You call yeah. your doctor, right? You, you don't call the glucometer company usually. So yeah. you're, you're getting rid of a lot of the nuisance calls and you're taking the burden of education away from the physician, which really they don't have time for that. And frankly, they don't have a way to bill for it either. So, um, you know, we're taking a lot of that uh, nuisance education pieces away from the physician's burden. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a big, that's a big uh, benefit. I, I can see that. Um, any other questions from the audience? I see uh, a few physicians that are thinking about asking questions. So please go ahead. Um, okay. So who's, who's your target? investor are you looking at angel investors or vcs you know what is or or practitioners who are interested who is your target who is your ideal investor that you're looking for well i don't know that there's an ideal at a four million dollar raise that is venture territory so we're entertaining a price round from a lead investor hopefully on a venture group but uh we're certainly open uh right now we still have an open safe note uh, that's at a $7 million valuation cap. So uh, if someone is motivated early, they can still get in at a better valuation. Yeah. But uh, so we would consider angel. We would consider, uh, you know, we're kind of for California, what we'll call a late seed round. In Chicago, this would be a series A, it really doesn't matter what <laughs> you call it. Uh, but, uh, but yes, both are on the table. Um, is... You know, the other thing I was thinking was some of the established companies, let's say a uh, a device manufacturer, you know, some somebody who's manufacturing glucose meters, you know, they, they could be they could be a potential investor or partner, right? Absolutely. Well, we have four of them under contract right now where we're doing direct services for them because they also realize that it's much more likely that a patient's going to stay on a continuous glucose monitor if they know how to use it. Uh, and again, they're manufacturers. They don't have the resources to, to educate all of their users. So, but absolutely, um, we're, we're working. I, I don't know, doctor, what you can say about some of the partnerships, but we are we are working with other device and pharma companies uh, that want yeah, to use pharma too. And, and are actually considering investing in us. Yes, that is, in, we're in those discussions. Great, great. All right, uh, audience. Any other questions? Uh, otherwise, uh, what's what's your final word, Adam and Prem? Well, I I think uh, you know I I for myself, I am really energized by this. It's it's one of the most uh, intriguing uh, companies I've been involved with because, as you mentioned, it. It, it's an elegant, simple solution to a big problem, and it's very scalable. And, you know, for that reason, I think there could be a lot of different acquisition exits down the road once we uh, get a, a, to a better size where it makes sense for us. Uh, but I think ultimately, you know, if you want to do well by doing good, I think, you know, given the fact that we're addressing the, the most underserved populations, and we're treating them with white glove treatment. We're taking care of them in a way that they're not used to being treated. So I, I think at the end of the day, that's why everyone loves this company and, and, and 
comes in and does their job. I think Arvind has a question. Arvind? Hi, Arvind Kavle. I'm an endocrinologist in Pennsylvania. And I'm sorry I missed the first half of your presentation. Um, so I heard that your, your uh, target uh, um, population is mostly through conventional insurance and Medicare networks or Medicaid networks. Have you considered out of out of a network kind of arrangement where uh, um, there may be direct buyers or direct uh, to employer uh, groups? employer or patient uh, arrangements? So direct to patient we do right now. There are a, a small fraction of patients that are self pay, and we're perfectly fine with that. We're set up to bill for it. Um, but uh, employers, uh, I think, is a different animal right now. I think uh, there, there you're going to end up competing with all of those other companies like the Omadas, the wellness companies that have been beating down the doors of employers. Um, you know, I think it's a great market and we might entertain going in with a partner and we're, we're having some preliminary discussions there. But like I said, there's 45 percent of the people that are not employed you know, insured by employers right now. And we're feasting on that market. And there's so much of it left that, <laughs> you know, we don't need to make that turn to, towards employers just yet. But, you know, we, we are having some opportunistic conversations. Great. Any, any physician partners you're looking for or, you know, other types of uh, uh, clinicians? Our seed round actually was uh, half funded by endocrinologist from uh, California, Northern and Southern California. So yes, absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Okay. And, Thank you. Yeah, there's, they still have a safe round open, so it's a good good way to for physicians to get into that, uh, you know, lower valuation and higher chance of uh, success. All right, uh, Frem, do you have any last words? I think you know. Oh. No, we are on, no. like, on the right path, and I'm. I see my diabetes total going to like eight x, ten x times in the next three to four years. Great, great, Adam. Yeah, I you just. Uh, I don't want to repeat my earlier summary, but yeah, <laughs> I really appreciate the opportunity, and we're very happy to speak with anyone one on one. If you want to follow up with us, please leave us your information. Uh, we'd love to work with you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Prem and Adam, for this wonderful uh, deep dive.